Hello and welcome to everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. While we're waiting for people to join, if you already um, checked in, uh, please add where you're watching from in our chat box so we have an idea where our viewers are from. I'm Sarah Thomas, I'm based at Auckland Zoo, so hello from New Zealand. Okay, so we're about to start. I can see we've got viewers from South Africa, from other, from New Zealand, uh, from Japan. And so uh, keep putting in where you're viewing from in the chat box and we'll get started. So um, welcome. Um, this is the fourth IZE webinar of the series. Um, we're actually halfway through the series, um, which is fantastic. These webinars are designed to help you unpack Social Change for Conservation, the World Zoo and Aquarium Conservation Education Strategy. And this initiative was created by the IZD Board to provide support and professional development to help you through this new strategy. <clears throat> so all um, today is about is chapter four, and it has the title, Applying Approaches and Methods in Conservation Education. I'm Sarah Thomas, I'm the Head of Conservation Advocacy and Engagement here at Auckland Zoo in New Zealand, and I'll be your host and moderator and we also have Kim um, Horman from St. Louis Zoo, and she's going to be our tech um, supervisor for today. So as people are checking in, I'll just give you an idea of our format. So today we have two speakers. First of all, we'll hear from Steffi John, who's at the Madras Crocodile Bank and Centre for Herpetology in India. Then we'll move over to Scotland and we'll hear from Stephen Willard from Zoo Stephen. And then we're going to have a panel session after that, um, where we're joined by Mel Wyatt, who's from Zoos Victoria in Australia, uh, Akana Haitai from uh, Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary in Australia. She's also on the IZD board at the moment. And then we also have Dr. Bridge Kishore Gupta from the Reliance Foundation in India, and he's also an IZD board member. So a few housekeeping um, notices before we begin. So please be aware that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted on the IZD um, YouTube channel. So by staying and participating, you are consenting to be part of this recording. And hello to all the viewers who are watching this later on our YouTube channel. And to note, if you did miss the first three um, sessions, they are available now to watch. Um, as this is a webinar, um, all the viewers are on mute. And so please put your questions, comments, um, ideas in the chat box or the Q&A box, and we'll see those for the panel session later on. So before we get to our speakers, we are going to have a couple of polls, and this is just to check in where we're at. Um, so Kim, if you're ready with the first poll, we'll get that up for you to have a look at. So if you're watching from home, you won't see the poll, but I'll just kind of give you an idea of the questions as viewers here are filling it in. So we're just asking about choose your IZD membership level, whether you're an institutional member, individual member, and then the second question is about how you heard about the webinar, whether that's through our social media, our website, or our email. And um, I can see the poll in action and we can have a, a few more um, minutes, seconds to, to fill that in. And Kim, if you want to decide when to close that so we can see the results. Are you seeing the results now? You should see them. I am seeing the results. Thanks, Kim. I didn't know if we were still going. So hopefully viewers um, watching now can see that 64% of you are the institutional members and the, um, the highest, uh, way, the, the most percentage way that you heard about the webinar was through our ISAD email. So this is really useful for us to know. Um, do we have another poll there, Kim, for us to share? 
Yes, we do. One more real quick. Sorry, my I'm clicking and my computer's not doing what I want to do. Ah, technology. <laughs> there we go. Oh, that's the nope, same. that's the same one. <laughs> hang, hang on, everybody. Don't answer that one. Um, okay, take two. Th there we go. So poll number two, if you want to, viewers now can uh, fill this in. And for those that are watching later, this asks, uh, what stage are you at uh, implementing the World Zoo and Aquarium Conservation Education Strategy at your zoo and aquarium? So the options are you've read the document, but nothing else. Um, you maybe have watched the first webinar or two, and that was helpful. The third one is having conversations with colleagues about how you could implement the strategy. And then the last one is my organization is starting to make a plan to implement those changes. So have a three, read through those options and decide where you're at. And this is really helpful for the IZD board to really um, work out what training and support we need to give our membership. So we'll give you a few more seconds. I can see we're nearly up to 80% voted. <clears throat> okay, so you can now see the results. So we've got an interesting picture here, um, which is moving the, the we've got 36% um, of people are having conversations with colleagues about how they can implement the strategy. Um, and 36% are now starting to make a plan. And it's interesting to see from the very first webinar we had, there was more people at those first two positions. And we're, it's really great to see that people are now having conversations and start to implementing those changes. So thanks, Kim. We can uh, move on to our next bit. And I've just got a couple of slides to share um, just to really frame um, this webinar. Um, and it really gives an idea of um, where it fits within the whole strategy. Um, before I do that, I just wanted to kind of give a shout out to um, invite people to um, become a speaker. Uh, this only happens with you. And so we're actually halfway through our webinar series, but you can see on the screen, we've actually got four more sessions to um, go through on animal care and welfare, conservation, sustainability, training and professional development, and then evaluation and research. So if you would like to be our speaker, what you need to do is email me and we can get you into one of these sessions over the next few months. So moving on to the topic, um, the Applying Approaching Methods in, in Conservation Education has these recommendations. And so what you can see that is, this is the kind of um, the what and how of conservation education. We're going to talk about the pedagogical, behavioral, communication approaches that we need to do to start achieving the conservation education outcomes. If you've read this chapter, it's, it's pretty big. There's lots of different topics in there. They talk about theoretical considerations, key messages, language, tonality, optimism, cultural diversities, and how to measure quality. So we have lots to talk about today. And so this is the frame around our speakers and all our panel sessions. So have a look at those um, recommendations. And do you have a question uh, for our, our speakers and our panelists around those recommendations and around this topic today? And while you're thinking about that, what we're going to do is go over to our first speaker, who is Steffi John, who is an education officer at the Madras Crocodile Bank uh, Centre for, uh, for Herpetology in India. And so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Steffi, when you're ready, you can start sharing your screen. Over to you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, can everyone see my screen pretty good? We can see your screen if you want to go to slideshow view. Uh, I, I put on the slideshow now. Yes, that's perfect. Okay, great. Awesome. So, um, hi everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. And, um, you know, uh, here at India, it's around 11, 11.30. So, um, I believe, um, you know, we would be talking about the chapter four, applying, uh, applying approaches and methods in conservation education. And this one, before I could, you know, take you through it, the arc has been closed for almost another three months. And for the past year, 
we've been doing only virtual programs we haven't done like the, you know the real program which we used to do before the pandemic so what i did was like how can i make different approaches and methods using the virtual program and you know i'll be sharing with you the experience that i had with that and yeah the the things that worked out and the things that haven't sort of thing that will be uh, i'll take you around so so the cross curricular approach is something that we speak about in chapter 4 and it is on you know developing the knowledge keep understanding of what they're learning and some sort of activity to keep them pretty uh, you know uh, engaged with it so that they won't um, you know forget it usually when we have people at the park we will have them you know come see it up close something a story that we always remember but for a virtual program it's a huge different ball game and i had two different categories meaning two different bunch of students that i did the program with so the category 1 we had about 40 to 50 students and i uh, made sure we have one program every week and it will talk about a particular topic let's say only on turtles only on tortoises or uh, crocodiles lizards and snakes so that gives you five and the q and a the deep understanding of the q and a was um the program is for 45 minutes and after that i Uh, i would spend at least 30 minutes with them with the participants to go through all the questions and you know answer all of it and the category 2 i had about uh, 10 students and three programs where i combined like turtles and tortoises uh, crocodiles and lizards and snakes that gives me three programs q and a is there but it is not as you know long as the category 1 so i have about 5 to 10 minutes of q and a then i send them out quiz so a follow up would be there and each programs i send out quiz and in that quiz they have to answer uh, uh, quite a few questions and then at the end there's always activities each quiz activity was very different uh, so i made it know one would be like um, you know craft work they have to do it and then they have to see the video and write about it and the other one was fun you just have to see the video and dance and send it across okay so these are the two categories that i've been focusing on and creating the curiosity to take part okay to make them engage into it is the key thing so program trailer like you know how movie trailers work we watch the trailer and we be like very excited to you know watch that movie so i thought we can do a program trailer for this <clears throat> that would help you know the participants be like you know what i'm curious i want to see it i want to take part in it and selecting a topic that i can connect with them even the trailer so here i am having a uh, green anaconda his name is loki by the way and i talked about him and more the topic that i usually connect with are movies movies play a huge impact with the generations uh, you know even with me actually uh, so i select a, a movie like the harry potter or Uh, you know uh, the old anaconda movies so make them understand they are not as how they are portrayed in the movies but they are very different uh, the characters and all so that makes them wonder it is the opposite of what i'm explaining to them to them uh, compared to the movies and i talk about you know there are so many other animals we can talk about learn about and that gets them you know intrigued be like you know i want to see what it is and there's always a surprise element that i have them i never tell everything that they're going to see so that when the surprise element happens it will be like wow factor for them and participatory certificate is something that they feel really happy and proud about once they finish off so i right now i'm sending out e certificates participatory e certificates to all my participants right so captivating the virtual audience uh, program theme so in this i always have theme in my programs it will either be baby reptiles or turtles versus tortoises so in this picture you can see the turtle versus tortoise that is happening and conveying them the content through stories i uh, when we shifted to the virtual aspect of for the past one year i it was bit difficult for me to move from an experience that you see from being in the zoo to an experience that you see through your electronic gadget was a huge take on me but the stories that i bring to them is what sticks on like they get it they want to know more it's it's something that they get to 
talk about it to their family, friends, you know, and that's how they try to learn. So in this, uh, I usually used to talk about in the early 2000s, you know, one is a star tortoise and the other one is an Indian black turtle that he's holding. So in star tortoise, I used to talk about a story where in the early 2000s, there was a, you know, uh, they take these star tortoise for pet trade and illegally a lot of them are piled up in big sacks and they kind of uh, shift it around. So the forest department got to know it and they also alerted people here. So both you know, parties were coming towards it. And the person who was doing that somehow got to know and threw the sack full of these star tortoise somewhere and went off, you know. So people around that area in the meantime saw that and be like, you know, oh no, this is this is not the way the animal has to be treated and took all the star tortoise and threw it into a water body. By the time people reached there, 60% of them died uh, because, you know, tortoise don't swim very well like the turtles do. And the intention was really, really good. You know, they really wanted to help out the animal. They saw there was, you know, they felt bad for it. Uh, it's completely understandable. But there's something that I tell my participants that you have to know about the animal before you even rescue them, help them, or even if you want to have them at your home. You should always know that. Without knowing, you cannot make a move towards them. So in that way, I talk about the habitat, kind of connecting dots here and there, right? And my animal activity, uh, I show um, these uh, snake feeding on uh, rat and sometimes enrichments where we spray water on an animal and they just close their eyes and just enjoy that. So different activities would be this. So, and the other, uh, you know, factor that I noticed was sometimes I have to move from one place to another while doing a program. And when you need to move from one place to another, a network is not that great, it gets iffy. So I have to be very, very slow when I'm moving from there. I cannot run or do a speed walk. So while I'm walking from one place to another, I try to talk about different departments in the zoo so that there won't be awkward silence asking them to wait, we wait two minutes. No, none of those waiting would be there. So, and sometimes colleagues would be walking by in the zoo and all I ask is smile and wave. You know, so when they do that, I'll be like, oh, you saw that person, that person is our zoo manager here and this is what he does. And if they see a curator there, I'll be like the curator of the, uh, of the zoo and this is what he does. In that way, they also get an outline of the team, zoo team and what, what people do here. And also this will intrigue them to join up uh, you know, for programs with different concepts like zoo bed programs or so things like that. And it kind of keeps us occupied for that walking period. So this is how the program went on and my learning outcomes. Uh, so the category two, I've sent out, uh, you know, quiz and all that. Now the quiz was three, uh, three quizzes were sent out and I had about 90% respond. And in this quiz, I made it through Google Forms. You guys, Google Forms is really easy. It's free. It, uh, you can play around with it very much. You can do uh, match the following. You can do uh, ID the picture sort of thing. It gets it very fun way of uh, engaging with your participants, even after finishing it. And it also tells us um, how much they've learned from the program. So here, everyone got to know what the answer is. And in this one, frequently missed question, is something as an educator, I would also look at it and be like, where I have to be, uh, you know, give a little more details about it, where I can, you know, focus a little bit more, maybe uh, not a lot of them understood it, or, you know, make a little bit changes here and there. And then ask how the virtual program, how do they like it and all that. Okay, now, the other concept was activity, right? So this is the activity that I asked people to do it. So for three quiz, I need about 10 participants. So overall, I should have got 30 activity sheets, okay? I got three activity sheet. So here I have two of them. So just that, when I ask them, why is that? This, it's a fun activity. You have to draw something or look at a video and explain. And there was another activity where they have to dance, record it and send it to me. That's all, I, all it was. The answer was, we always have activities in school. Like we don't want to do another activity, you know? So. That made me realize they are okay to take the quiz, but they don't want to do any more further on. So this is something that I'm still figuring out a way to make this activity easily be used inside the form itself. So it won't take extra time. So I'm kind of working on that right now. So this is how the learning outcome has come so far. And 
different approaches. So with all the programs that I've done, there are a few things that I've faced, um, you know, um, it worked out and some not so much. Okay, so virtual games, this is a game that I've learned from uh, last year Isaac conference. So they'd have this treasure hunt. You have to go pick things. They'll tell you things like, show me a spoon and I have to run and get a spoon. I loved it. Now, I applied it to a bunch of children. You can see that in the picture. Few did do it, like they were running around and, and few were just sitting in front of their uh, uh, you know, laptop or phone, whatever it is. They asked their parents to like, bring me that phone, bring me that uh, spoon or bring me that sanitizer. So the parents were running around and giving it to the child and the child shows it right in front of. Well, I told them that they have to do it, but no, the, the parents were involved. But you know, the good thing is the parents were involved in it too. So the game went like that and trying user-friendly equipment. So I kind of um, uh, use this right now. Uh, the one that everyone uses for the TikTok, it kind of works really well for uh, animals also. So you kind of set it up and you can show animals uh, wherever, whatever you're focusing on. Like if you want to talk about the eye, you talk about it, bring it up close. And it um, it was a budget friendly equipment. It was about $14 or $15. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty good. And another thing is, even if you're going around with your phones and all that, in one of my sessions that I'm in a garial enclosure and the assistant curator is feeding the garial and I'm showing the children like, you know what, look how they do and all. My phone heated up and it just um, switched off in the middle of the program. So, uh, but thankfully I had a, a friend of mine who was attending that program. So I called him up and be like, please let know uh, the everyone that I'll be back in five, 10 minutes. So uh, I had to kind of figure out another phone and then did it. But it is something that the participants understood, understood like uh, as much as the gadgets are user friendly, there are times they mess up big time. And another selective animal enclosure during Q and A. So during my Q and A's, it's better that the, you know, um, they, you can focus on an enclosure like, and you take up the questions. So the students or the other participants who are waiting for the question, they can still see some sort of movement or something that is happening inside the enclosure. But um, I try to avoid big crocodile enclosure because mo mostly they're always inside the water and I'm just showing like a pool full of, like a place where it's just water body there. So I kind of avoid that, but I go into places where uh, select the enclosure where, where the animal is out and I set it up and I take my Q&A so students would still be interested watching what it is. And a heads up to the participants regarding network issue if you have any. Uh, the participants do understand so I always tell them that we might have network issues. If I log out, I will come back in. It's not that the program ends. And uh, another thing is during the feeding sessions with animals, uh, it depends on their mood and depends on your luck, basically. So might not come out and we might not see them up close, but you know, this is how it is. So giving those kind of um, heads up will make them understand the program better and it won't take them on a you know surprise mode like i was hoping to see this it didn't happen that sort of thing won't happen okay so a heads up is always uh, um, encouraged so this is how the set of programs virtually i'm you know involving certain approaches and methods and things that have worked out and things that haven't so these are things that i've gone through the do's and don'ts and the trials and the um, you know error sort of method that i've learned but yeah, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. And if you want to email, you can always go for education at Madras Croc Bank or my Instagram ID, you can message me there. And I thank IZE and Croc Bank for the opportunity that was given. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Steffi. That was really interesting and really <laughs> um, lots to learn about how you kind of switch your approaches to that virtual kind of platform. Yeah. Steffi, if you want to put your email address in the chat box so people can have that if they yes. want to contact you, that would be great. And for our viewers, have a think about some questions you'd like to ask Steffi later on in our panel session. So we're going to quickly move from uh, India to Scotland and to Stephen Willard. Stephen is a freelance uh, educator at Zoo Stephen. Uh, you, many of you know him. He's been in zoos around 30 years um, and also has served um, many years on the IZD board. So over to you, Stephen, and you have about 10 minutes. 
Thank you very much. And good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whatever uh, it is for you, wherever you're watching. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to you today. And uh, I'm going to just give you a little bit of um, a presentation about how I've applied pretty much what the applying approaches and methods to conservation education is in, in two sort of aspects of my career. So I hope it's very helpful for you and look forward to questions later. Um, a key aspect of developing your education plans uh, is to start by asking the questions, why are we doing it? Who's it for? What are the learning outcomes that we want to achieve? What's appropriate for the audience that we've chosen? Uh, so you can look at a cross-curricular view. Uh, you can look at the methods, which may focus on science and conservation. Uh, we can use stories, um, but in so doing, we're often going to be using English and language. We can be using the arts, and Steffi's given us some great examples of different ways uh, that she's already applying this process. It's important to recognise that one programme will not fit all. And as you can see, as Einstein says, everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it's stupid. So we've got to recognise that sometimes the education system is set up for certain people, but it doesn't meet the needs of other people. And our audiences are those people. So we have to recognise we need to provide difference. Uh, by the way, Einstein also said, education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. So bear that in mind, especially when we consider that one of our main purposes is behavior change. So we concentrate quite a lot on facts and maybe that's something that we need to recognize that uh, we can do a little bit different. I'm gonna focus on two examples. Uh, one that I was involved in at Edinburgh Zoo and the other with Chamlong group in China. So uh, when a new chimpanzee house was planned in Edinburgh Zoo, uh, from the beginning, education was part of the plan. So it was integration of conservation, education and research and linking to an in-situ project in Uganda. Chimpanzees are very interesting, not least in all the similarities to humans. So that was a good starting point for us to focus upon. Visitor research was conducted before we started work on the exhibit. I wanted to know what people knew already about chimpanzees. How did they feel about chimpanzees? And that would then help set the learning outcomes for the new development. We also use small focus groups, uh, which is something that everybody can do. It's not too difficult. Uh, I actually use just a couple of schools. I use some members of staff, some volunteers, uh, some visitors. And I also happen to be working with a group of primatologists uh, on their course in Oxford, so I was able to use them to test ideas with as well. So a simple approach to outcomes was used. What will visitors learn? What facts do we want them to go away with? What will visitors feel? What emotions, what stories can we engage them with? And then what do visitors do? How will visitors engage and how will they interact with what we're showing them? So you can see in the illustrations here uh, from Bodongo Trail in Edinburgh Zoo that some of the examples we compared chimpanzees to humans by looking at the skeletons and had an interactive screen. We had uh, chimpanzee tool use demonstrated with little videos and also the tools themselves. How chimpanzees use plants as self-medication and we created a medicine chest to try and link it to that human chimpanzee similarity. And the basis of chimp behaviour was taught through a copy me cartoon film. So that was very, very successful. But it's also important to link the project to the work that we supported in Uganda. So one of the issues in the Bodongo forest has been the setting of snares. Uh, chimps have got caught in that. And as you can see, we've got a chimp there that's lost its hand after being caught in a snare. On talking to a few people, it was apparent that this story often left them feeling negatively towards Ugandan people living there. So it was important to then rethink the story. So the story can be told better by actually focusing on the positive work of the Ugandans. So the staff there, you can see they're involved in the research on the chimpanzees. Their work supports the local community and that supports them with their needs 
so that that reduces the use of snares. So it's a different way of telling the same story. A bigger issue that actually came out um, when we were researching all of this was actually large scale agriculture was a serious problem with the sugar plantations around the forest. So that's much more of a big issue to talk about. And that relates to people visiting the zoo because they know that they use sugar, etc. OK, moving to my second example, Shenlong Safari Park in Guangzhou in China. Uh, it's a good standard safari park. They achieved WASA membership in 2019, and it belongs to a large leisure group uh, that runs zoos, hotels, theme parks, and they have a total engagement of about 30 million people a year. So here, it was really still important to focus on desired outcomes, but recognize the different context and the different audience. We need to start where the people are at, not where we want them to be. So. We might want them to be behavior change, we might want them to stop using plastics and so forth, but they've got to understand why from the very beginning. So in this picture, um, in a 10 minute presentation I was given uh, on chimpanzees of all things, so you know, one of the topics that I was quite interested in, it was part of a 40 minute African animal show for 2000 Chinese people. Uh, and I had to do it a couple of times. I had to carefully think about what were my desired outcomes from this activity? Well, actually, the reason I was doing it, the key outcome I was looking for was training and confidence for the park staff themselves. So I was leading by example. I was expecting them to be able to do this. So I had to show them that it can be done even by somebody that can't speak Chinese. Uh, another outcome was it was to support Chumlong in its desire to be entertaining and popular whilst also being innovative and feature science and education, which is something quite new in this context. Very much about entertainment in the past, now it's actually trying to connect that into messaging. And of course, the third outcome was for the audience themselves, and that was to be, you know, to excite and to enthuse the audience about chimpanzees and encourage them to find out more. It should also be noted that the presentation had to be visual, given the setting and the audience, and that translation was available, uh, but it would disrupt the flow of me being able to present very much information. And no chimpanzees were being featured or presented during the show. Uh, so it was primarily birds, meerkats, antelope, and giraffe that were the live animals actually as part of the, the show. So what I actually did was a brief introduction to me, which was translated, and then a quick acting ape session. So I demonstrated some of the chimp behaviors as were shown in the little cartoon that I'd done in Edinburgh. And I in invited a couple of children from the audience to come and join me on stage and act out all the different movements of a chimpanzee so that people could understand a little bit of the behavior of chimpanzees. Feedback was incredibly positive uh, and staff actually reported that more visitors were asking where are the chimpanzees in the zoo so they could go and see them after the show, which staff said they, they didn't usually get people asking to go and see animals that weren't actually featured in the show. So that was, that was a good success. Finally, using some of the team at Chumlong as an example, this is the general approach that I would recommend in implementing the strategy. Be open to ideas, discuss it with people, learn from one another, make some time to review it and plan the activities using the strategy. Invest in time and effort in training and developing staff so that they understand what the program is all about and review your progress regularly. At the outset, it's quite important. What are your measurable objectives and decide how they're going to be measured and by whom? All I would say on this one is sometimes if you set something up yourself and then you try and evaluate it yourself, you might actually sort of miss a couple of things that somebody as an impassive uh, observer would see. So it's quite useful to have somebody else that you can use to do your evaluation as long as they understand what the programme was all about in the first place. So it's well worth thinking about that. OK, so my contact details are here on the screen. Um, so email, Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I'm currently working on projects in the Emirates and in Indonesia, as well as in the UK. Uh, but I'm happy to answer questions and uh, discuss things further. So back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Stephen. Lovely few examples to get us thinking. Um, 
viewers uh, watching now, please start thinking of those questions uh, for both uh, Steffi and Stephen. Lots that they talked about, lots to think about. I'm sure you've got some uh, questions that you're dying to ask. Uh, while you're having a think about that, I am going to introduce um, our panelists who are going to join us. Um, delighted to be joined by Mel Wyatt, who is a senior manager of education at Zoos Victoria Australia. Welcome, Mel. Um, we also have uh, Akane Haitai, who's a communication specialist in media relations at the Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary in Australia, um, and she's also on the IZD board. And then Dr. Bridge Kishore Gupta, who is the project director of the Reliance Foundation in India, and he's also on the IZD board. So um, I'm not seeing any questions in the, the chat yet. So what I'm going to do is uh, come to you first, Mel, um, and talk about um, learning outcomes. So in the recommendations for chapter four, it talks about measurable learning outcomes for all aspects of conservation education. And if you read that, you might get a bit intimidated. So what does that mean? How does it work? So can you talk us through how you and your team at Zoos Victoria think about measurable learning outcomes and embed that into the conservation education programs that you do? Sure. It is a little bit of a confusing point when we're talking about conservation because um, a lot of the time we interpret conservation as, as needing to make those direct impacts in the wild in all aspects of what it is that we do. It's important for educators to understand that the context that we're working in, especially if we're working with schools, we're talking about measurable learning outcomes of learning in education, rather than needing to try and solve all of the world's problems <laughs> and do the big things. So if we can chunk it down a little and make it achievable for ourselves, it, it makes it a little bit more accessible. Um, I think the, the process of learning really is threefold and Zoos Victoria has been using a, a pedagogy for quite some time now that many of you would have heard of, connect, understand, act. And when we apply that to the method of, of learning um, and education within a formal context, it really does work very well. So the process of learning is really about, first step is, inspiring the desire to actually learn something in the first place and in the world that we live in and especially with young people today that's really challenging there's so much out there to to inspire and to distract everybody um, in so we really need to to do things in a powerful way um, Zoos are great at doing that. We really have the content and we have the, the wow factor. And so we're on a good path right from the outset. But it's important for us not to forget that that connection and that wow and that inspiration and the desire to actually learn the content in the first place is a real part of the process and not going immediately into the content and into the understand is, is just as valuable. The second part of the process really is um, repeated practice of skills and knowledge. And there is a lot of research around now to tell us that any new skills and knowledge takes at least eight repeated practices of going from uh, short-term memory into long-term memory. So while well, we're in, um, engaging with people in a zoo context, often we're not engaging with them for, for longer than 30 minutes um, to, to two hours maybe. A lot of us have different models that we're working with, um, but that, that inhibits us from being able to really embed re uh, effective repeated practice and learning. So we need to find other creative ways of supporting learners and supporting teachers especially, who are the key in this entire thing, um, to be able to support their learners in being able to do that repeated practice. Then the last part of the process is mastery and that's the consolidation of the, that knowledge and skills. And the consolidation of knowledge and skills is most effective when it's real and it's in a real world context. And again, zoos have the wow factor for creating experiences that are real, that are real context and that have real authentic people working in the space to be able to engaging that process. 
So I suppose um, when we look at what we're doing as, as an effective learning outcome and measuring our learning outcomes, we look at, especially in the, in the context of, of formal learning, which is the area that I'm responsible for, how many people are going through that process and sticking through that process and coming to the consolidation component of their learning. It really means that we've got to work much more effectively than just delivering a single session of a 30 minutes of WOW at the zoo. It means we need to be able to provide all the, the support, the guidance, the professional development for the teacher involved in the process, who's really the person that's actually the key in taking uh, their learners through the longer term part of that process of being able to actually do the repeated practice and encourage that consolidation of knowledge and skills and to be able to create uh, experiences that allow and support and guide um, students and teachers to be able to actually consolidate those skills in real world contexts and finding examples and experiences to do that. Fabulous answer. Well, that was great. Um, if you've got a link to the Connect Understand Act um, section on your website, it'd be great for you to share that in the chat for, for um, our viewers. Um, so, Akana, I'm going to come to you next as a communication specialist. There's quite a lot of um, communication tactics in Chapter 4 uh, around language, tonality, optimism, framing of messages. So um, what advice would you give people if they're trying to think about how can I think about framing what I'm doing to get those desired outcomes? My, my probably biggest advice is keeping it simple. I think um, when I first started at Lone Pine, there was just so many mixed messages and, and things everywhere. And, and, and I get it because, you know, there are so many different things out there that you want to do. So everyone, like even when I've been in, in a meeting, we all get really excited. We've all got ideas and we all want to do all these things. And I think sometimes, um, which, which I've learned here from Lone Pine, is that we've tried to do too much all at once. And then there's so many messages and all the things. And then I'm sure everyone's heard of the word like ecophobia and all that sort of stuff. You just get overwhelmed. And, and so what we've ended up doing is going, right, we need to really keep it simple. What are the really, really simple messages that everyone can do really easily let's just start with there <laughs> and so and I think even when I'm still talking to other people in the industry people are still like oh we want to do this this and this and this and, and it's like no no let's let's really just focus on you know one two maybe three things um, and and it's just what Mel was saying with that repetitiveness so what we've done is we've tried to have those key messages that we have that we want to get across to our guests, um, our students and everything. And we've collaborated with our keepers, um, our education staff, even our cleaners, um, our retail team, everyone to have the same conservation messages. So everywhere these guests go around the sanctuary or online, social media, everywhere, it's consistent. So even if you kind of weren't listening at that Raptor show about what they were saying, but you go to the sheepdog show because you care more about what they're saying, it's the same messaging here and there. So that's what, look, I have to admit, we're not there yet. <laughs> I, I make it sound like we're doing it really well, but we're definitely not. It's just something that we've noticed and we have really sat down and gone, right, let's let's do it this way. And it's made it easier for, for our staff as well because they're on board because they understand it. And it's like, oh yeah, I talked about this in this way. And it's like, oh, yeah, that person was talking about it. So it's then also bringing in that positivity within the sanctuary and within the departments of Lone Pine. And so one thing that is huge at, that we're working on right now at Lone Pine is communication amongst our own staff first. And, and that's really helped, I, I think, I'm not too sure, because we haven't actually done much um, evaluation or anything like that just yet. Um, we've got a bit of a new team that's just started on. So um, we'll probably look at that soon as well. But, but within the education team, our, um, uh, our actual programs that we have, the little tours that we run, the Junior Keeper program, it's all the same keepers running it. So the messaging is really, really consistent. And, and I, I just, I do feel like people have been giving us a lot of feedback recently on our social media and things like that, that our messaging 
has been positive. So everyone's everyone's response has been really positive as well. So um, even when there's obviously difficult um, themes that you have to kind of talk about that that you obviously do have to talk about we always put in the facts the scientific facts all that kind of stuff put a bit of a positive spin on it as well so people are like oh okay that's that's what they're trying to do this has happened blah 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 so um so going back to just keeping it simple uh and I know it sounds simple but it's not because you do you just you want to do all the things. <laughs> and, and I think it's it's really just taking one step at a time and it's small wins being able to get even get across to out of 10 people, one person leaves with one message it is a win. And, and I think that's come a lot from, you know, all the social sciences and things like that that you see, that it is just that tiny little bit that is in a positive way keep it going <laughs> so keeping it right. really really <laughs> simple so I know it, it, it's you. one of those things that we talk about a lot but uh, it's I've just noticed it so much here at Lone Pine that we're still trying to do too much and we have to keep trying to reel it back in to be like what is really important right now what is it that we really need to be focusing on to try and get those messages out great and I think the important thing I took from that is that we are all on a journey you know, this strategy, is, you know, is designed to support people wherever they are on their conservation education journey. And these webinars are here to support people and to start networking and to learn from each other. So you're absolutely right. It is kind of uh, looking at what you're doing, but always progressing, always kind of moving forward. Um, and so a question I'm going to move on to is around um, for, for all the, the um, speakers and panelists is around um, moving to a more uh, participatory approach. So if we think about the traditions of education, it was, you know, it was chalk and talk in the pre-computer days. And now, you know, the, you can have death by PowerPoint, a very didactic one way approach. And I'm really keen to hear from everybody some of your kind of uh, top tips about how you can move away from that kind of traditional approach into some more innovative participatory approaches to conservation education. So maybe, Stephen, we'll, we'll start with you. Just a few words. Um, any um uh, jewels of wisdom you've got for our viewers about how you can really turn that into a great participatory experience. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think it's great to learn from one another, and that's what these webinars are all about. Uh, I'm still learning after all the years that I've been doing uh, education. And I found that when I was working particularly with Chimlong in China, that one of the issues for me was obviously language and understanding what was going on. So I was looking at body language, I was looking at engagement and how people were interacting with each other. So that's, that's one thing to look at in terms of participation is that sometimes we might think people are participating, but if you actually study their body language, they might not be as engaged as we think they are. And it might be all sorts of reasons. But the example I'd like to sort of give you from Jim Long, which I was really impressed with, was the use of key sort of animals in the collection and having a small group of children learning from the keepers, learning from other staff. So it's not an educator that's actually the one that is imparting information. It's the children themselves asking questions. It's them because they've got an interest in that particular animal. They want to know what does it eat, how does it feed, where does it live and all that sort of stuff. So it's responding right. to what the audience actually asks us. And sometimes yeah. I think we ignore what the audience is asking because we've got, this is our message. This is what we want to say. And sometimes we just need to step back and say, well, what's the audience want to know? And how do we then frame our message into that? Great. Thanks, Stephen. Um, any, anybody else want to uh, say a few words? Bridge, we've not heard from you yet. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we can get our audiences participating more in our conservation education? Oh. Uh, hi, uh, Sarah. What you said, like a, uh, we are on a journey on this, uh, and the communication is uh, very important. I just want to give an example here. We are working with the tribals because India, you know, is such a big country. We have a different languages and all that. So working with the tribals uh, in a village uh, is totally different. Uh, and we bring those tribals because tribals hardly get an opportunity to come into the city zoos actually. So we brought a group of tribes and all that, and we were taking them to the amphibian exhibits. And then they said, okay, we eat them. They, they are very 
ugly creatures and all that and uh, if they buy it somebody may die and all that but uh, slowly these tribes people when we had an interaction with the keepers and then we took them to the their exhibits give them a slowly uh, how what is the role of their actually in the environment in the ecosystem and then we told them this is the actually your uh, uh, first indicator of your environmental health in your water body in a pool in a village where you are living when the first rain comes they start croaking and all that so we started linking this whole story to the ecosystem and to the ecology and then how it interact day to day life then they slowly what we saw is so tremendous change in these uh, tribals and then they saw they everybody is as and when they find tribes these uh, frogs they start calling us they said there is some rescue some frogs are there would you like to keep in a zoo so i said uh, there is a communication how you approach how you take up things actually which is very much important and we have been working very hard with the different agencies uh, because you know uh, the education uh, though we have a national zoo policy and education is one of the um, i mean a lead uh, part every zoo should do it i mean that's the one thing objective so there are hundreds of objectives staffy has given a good nice examples stephen has given a beautiful examples on that so i am sure that uh, we will have a some other day maybe say a more of such of examples from india and now we are also doing a our kanjavesh strategy translation in hindi so i am sure that it will go uh, throughout the country and other neighboring country also like in a uh, who has a who uh, who can read in hindi and interact and can make utilization of this strategy great Thank yeah. you so much, Bridge, and and yeah, yeah. So the Hindi translation of the strategy. Looking forward to that. And yeah. your example of how you worked with uh, different indigenous communities, uh, yeah. different cultures, is a really big part of Chapter Four about really knowing um, and removing our own kind of bias and thinking about the audiences that we are, are trying to connect to are very diverse. And how can we think about the approaches and methods that we want to tailor uh, and frame? to really um, promote those good conservation out outcomes and also serve our communities in the way that we want to. Sorry. Now, we do have a, a question in the uh, Q&A box. Thank you, Judy, uh, for your question. Um, first of all, she loves everything that you're saying, which is great. Um, but the question is, how do you ensure that everyone stays with the key messages and doesn't try to tell all the stories? So this is about how do we really focus on those key messages that we want to tell rather than trying to tell everything at once. Um, and maybe Steffi, if I can come to you first, at the, where you work, how do you really, you know, you've got lots of different species, lots of different messages. How do you really kind of think about what are the key messages you want to, to focus on and promote through your organization? So the stories that I usually <laughs> talk to people is, you know how the stories have the moral of it sort of thing that comes in that's where my key thing stands when i say a story so what is that that we learn in this is the you know how the habitat is very important the story about the tortoise as well so when they ask me about uh, you know you say all these things but what is the whole point of you know it's just a story thing has come forward before it's a story right it's nice yeah but the goal is to crack the empathy card so make them have feeling towards the animals that's when the key thing sticks with them right so i when i bring that animal out i specifically talk about the character you know what he was doing morning he was you know trying to give me a bite i mean it's common we work with animals if an animal bite it's not that like i work with you so long you can't do this to me sort of thing that's how they communicate with you if they're pissed at you or they are not happy with you you know that's how they be like stephy not today so i kind of tell them that and make them understand that they have the exact feeling what we have it's just that they cannot express and talk the way we do so we kind of take them for granted so this is where they live this is what they do and people always say snakes are always coming into my apartment i mean before your apartment what do you think that place was it was the ecosystem for the snakes they were happy breeding great food you know we kind of put a huge building block in there and they are confused so what do they do they are evolving they are adjusting with you you're not adjusting with them they're kind of putting up with us so how 
can we cohabit it together? So that's why all my you know talks would be like, if we both are there, what is that that we can do about it? And I usually talk about the snakes kind of focus on that a little bit more because there is also a huge cultural impact here. And every it's kind of it's a the India has a diverse culture, but the I kind of try to figure out the most common one that all of us have rather than going crazy trying to figure out yeah. everything you know that works pretty much so i kind of bring that in and be like you know we have so much respect for them but how about we show respect outside the culture as well so in that way they kind of think about it you know that one thought would you know will fire up is my goal that empathy card that one spark is what i try to figure out and i talk to people here great thank you so much steffi um, we're going to come to you next, Stephen. Mel, I'm just going to indicate you've got a question for you in the chat box, and I'm going to come to you after Stephen. So, Stephen, if you want to give us a, a quick comment, which I'm just yeah. aware of time, we have about um, five to ten minutes left, but over to you. Uh, just a very, very brief response, because Judy's question is really important, and it was about how does everybody uh, do the key message, and it's an institutional thing. So it's about working with the whole institution, so it's about how the whole strategy gets built into the development. So it's a slow process in a way, but it's also just that process of stop. And the example I just give you is think of a corporate organization and the way that they represent themselves. The one that comes to mind, unfortunately, is McDonald's. And it's that, have a nice day. And it's become a bit trite, it's become a bit silly, but it's part of their sort of mantra is everybody should have a nice day because they're going to McDonald's. We need to have something like that within our zoos, which is our message is, and it doesn't matter who you're talking to, whatever you're talking about, try and get that message through during their day. Great, thanks, Stephen. Um, Mel, I see that you've answered that in the chat. The question was around the Connect, Understand, Act training that you, you popped in the chat box. Um, do you want to a few just a, a minute on on that training and uh, um, and what it is and how people can find out more sure uh, so zoos victoria has uh, recently developed a leap which is the a consultancy that and there are a number of courses that are being now offered through the consultancy including animal welfare which has been, had an amazing uptake and is an incredible course and um, connect understand act is also one of the courses it's specifically organized uh, individually with each request and um, online is definitely an option for that training. Great, thanks Mel. Um, we're ra racing against time. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is uh, to ask him just to share a quick video about IZE membership and its benefits. So over to you, Kim. Enjoy the IZE webinar. Looking for more professional development and networking opportunities with fellow educators from across the globe? Why not grab the chance and join the ICE now? Found in 1972, our vision is to conserve global biodiversity through effective zoo and aquarium programs. With our worldwide members' continuous effort, we conserve biodiversity through encouraging sustainable behaviors in people that visit zoos and aquariums. The International Zoo Educators Association offers three types of membership with a wide range of professional development programs and events for capacity building, information and resources, and networking opportunities for educators and professionals at only 20 US dollars a year for Category 1 associate member. Do not miss our upcoming events, webinars and conference. Be part of the community. Join us now. Fantastic. So um, we're going to have the, the last poll in a, a, a few minutes. Um, but just before um, we do that, while Kim gets um, the poll ready, I'd like uh, to thank our, our speakers, Steffi and Stephen, our panellists, Akane, Mel and Bridge. Uh, and also like to thank Kim, who has done a, a great job making sure the tech works on these global uh, and multi time zone webinars. So thank you so much, Kim. Um, we just have a, a one last poll um, to, to go um, through. Um, just wanting your feedback on today's session. Uh, first question is about how valuable did you find this webinar um, for your journey with the uh, World Zoo and Aquarium Conservation Education Strategy? And the second question is, what would you like to see in future webinars? 
um, around this uh, strategy. So do you want more case studies, more explanation, more Q&A? Did we get it right this time? So just have a think of those two questions. And we'll give you a couple of um, more seconds and we'll see what the results are. Okay, I can see we're getting up to 90%, nearly done. And so Kim, when you're ready, you can share those results. There you go. So um, brilliant to hear everybody that you found this session very valuable. Um, uh, and we, what you'd like to see is that um, we got it right um, this time in terms of the mix between case studies and panelists, which is great to see. And so it's really important that you uh, give feedback if you'd like to see different speakers. If you would like to be a speaker, please do get in contact with me. It only happens because of you. Again, thank you so much for, for watching and thank you so much to our speakers and our panelists um, and to Kim as well. We'll see you next month uh, and take care. Bye.